Welcome. This is the Atrum webinar series. We are about to start in a few minutes. Investing may feel intimidating, but once you learn a few basics, it's actually easy to understand. And understanding and using that knowledge to your advantage are some of the most important things you can do to achieve a financially secure future. Here are five things to consider when investing. Remember, sure. S. Size. Know how much you are willing to invest given that investing doesn't promise returns. Allocate money first for needs and paying off debt. H. Horizon. Before you start investing, you should determine how long you are willing to keep your money invested for a specific goal. Long-term investing, at least 5 years, is best as it allows you to ride out market volatility. The longer the time horizon, the more aggressive or riskier portfolio an investor can build. Oh, objective. What are you investing for? For some, it's a short-term goal, like saving up for a car or maybe a vacation. If you need the money soon, you should invest in less volatile investments. On the other hand, your retirement or your child's college education allows you to invest in riskier investments compared to closer objectives. R. Risk Tolerance Not all people are the same when it comes to the risks they are willing and able to take. Do you prefer stable price movements without volatility? Can you stomach short-term paper losses in exchange for higher potential returns? It's best to know yourself. E. Experience Experience is the best teacher. Actual investment experience keeps one level-headed in making decisions. Investing experience also broadens one's knowledge of different investment instruments. So, before you invest, make sure you keep these terms in mind. Good day, everyone. Happy Friday. I am your host, Ramas Karaga from the Business Development Team, and I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar this fine afternoon. The first half of the year has been uncertain to say at least, particularly in the U.S. and European markets. In the previous quarter, we've dealt with the possibility of these markets going to a mild recession due to rising inflation and interest rates. The Federal Reserve remains to tighten its monetary policy, and as for the Asian market, with China slowly reopening its doors post-pandemic, we are expecting to see a positive growth in emerging markets such as here in the Philippines. For this webinar, we'll, we will be diving into the third quarter market outlook with Atram's very own Chief Investment Officer, Ms. Sandra Raulio. Sandra will be presenting a more comprehensive view on the upcoming quarter's outlook through the lens of Atram. And through this, we aim to strategize and create investment solutions that are suitable to each client's unique goals and requirements while assisting them in understanding the implications of their portfolios. So sit back, relax, and get ready to learn. We hope that by the end of this webinar, you will have gained a deeper understanding of current market outlook and be better equipped to make informed financial decisions in the months approaching. If you have burning questions, that you have thought of prior of this webinar, don't be shy and send them as early as now through the Q&A button found below your screen. And we will try to address to all your questions during the Q&A segment and even after this webinar. And before we formally begin, I'd like to inform everyone that this webinar will be recorded and it will be posted in all our social media platforms. So you can look back whenever you like it. Whether you are a beginner to the world of finance and investments or a seasoned investor who wants to stay up to date with the latest investment news and strategies, we got you covered. Our YouTube channel, Atram Studio, has a collection of videos that features everything you need to know about finance, investments, our past webinars, and even Atram itself. Make sure you subscribe to our official YouTube channel and hit the notification bell received to receive alerts on all your devices whenever we upload new videos. 
You can also check out our website at atram.com.ph for a comprehensive information regarding all the funds that we provide. And you may also follow us on our social media pages by scanning on the QR code flash on your screens to get the latest updates and trends not only on the financial world, but also, uh, but as well on our new offerings here at Atram. We would like to keep this webinar as interactive as possible, so we encourage you to send your questions through the Q&A tab found below your screen. Additionally, we will conclude with a short feedback survey after the webinar, and we hope you can participate to share your thoughts on today's session and suggestions on how we can enhance our webinar series. This afternoon, we are privileged and a pleasure to have with us today ATRAM's Chief Investment Officer, Sandra Araulio. She is responsible for overseeing all investment portfolio-related activities of the firm, including formulation and implementation of strategic tactical asset allocation decisions, funds and security selection calls, and market risk management for ATRAM's discretionary managed accounts. Across equity, fixed income, multi-asset strategies. She is a CFA charter holder and a member of the Board of Trustees for CFA Society Philippines since 2017 up to 2019. She is also a member of the Fund Managers Association of the Philippines. So let's not keep you all waiting, guys. And with me, get this show on the road. Take it away, Ms. Sandra. Good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for joining us for our third quart uh, second quarter uh, sorry, third quarter, second half 2023 market outlook. So without further ado, let's show our first slide. Okay, so I'm sure um, most of you, our audience, uh, have their ear on the ground and have seen um, news reports about how it's official. The U.S. is in a bull market. So it's actually verbatim. No, It's a headline that came out on June 8th. Uh, from CNN. Um, what is a bull market? It's when the market enters uh, or surpasses a 20% upside. And since October of last year, the market or the S&P 500 has um, gained more than 20%, so closer to 24%. And the Nasdaq Composite actually even returned higher, so closer to 30%, no? All right. Um, so that's the headline news. Uh, let's um, consider the context. On the next slide, um, I extended that graph you just saw for the to include the full year of 2022. It's the same two indices, the S and P 500 and the Nasdaq Composite. So if we consider uh, the end of 2021 or if you add the full year of 2022 to year-to-date 2023 performance, it's still on a cumulative basis underwater. The S&P 500 is down, call it 7.5%, at least at up till the end of Ju uh, June. And the NASDAQ Composite, which is a very tech-heavy index, is down close to 15%. Um, Maybe for more context uh, i'm showing on the right hand side here a graph of the four indices that we keep track of here in atram so we look at the psei for the local equity market the bpi government bond index for philippine fixed income uh, msci world index for the entire world and the Bloomberg Global Aggregate Total Return Index for Global Bonds. Um, it's, it's the same period uh, starting from the beginning of 2022 up to year to date, uh, 20, uh, end of June 2023. And in, in the aggregate, all global equity markets are um, cumulatively down close to 14%. So this includes Europe, China, all global equity markets, while um, the PSEI is down 9%, the global aggregate bond index, even if it's a bond uh, index, it's down 10%, and 
and it's actually only the government bond index that is positive no but not but not by much positive one so um it it kind of uh paints an entirely different picture when we take a step back and we don't even have to go that far on the next slide um i'm just showing here uh a ranking of these four asset class classes in in terms of returns for the last 10 years and what's uh, immediate or what what the, the immediate takeaway is that the there is no pattern or that there is no one asset class that will consistently give you positive returns on any calendar year but from a compound annual growth rate basis no so the 10 year kager so it's like the uh average returns for the entire 10 year period the behavior is as expected. So the more, the riskier, actually, technically, hindi nga eh, kasi Philippine equity markets are um, are ranked uh, at a higher risk than the global market. But this is, uh, doesn't take FX into account. No? So the global indices here are in dollar terms, while the local indices are in peso. Oh, sorry. Sorry, it's already in peso terms pala. Already in peso terms, um, and the riskier peso denomination actually um, is you're not compensated for being a, a peso investor. The dollar exposure um, helped as far as giving uh, global equity markets the 4.5% CAGR for the last 10 years. Um, year to date, uh, while global equity markets are positive 6.8%. It was down 19.8% in 2022. So it's uh there's a lot of uh gyrations involved and in, uh what determines these asset class returns are anchored on what's going on on the ma macroeconomic and market environment. So on the next slide, I just wanted to uh, drill down further on the rally that's happening in the U.S. for the last uh, eight, uh, three quarters from the end of um, October 2022 to the first half of the year. So apart from it being a very U.S.-centric rally, it's also very specific to, uh, to an industry, tech. And even more specific is it's AI-fueled. Um, so, in the past months, there's been a lot of headline uh, news about the, the potential of AI, the developments, and this has pushed uh, flows or money towards firms that are um, exposed to, to this segment. No? So, in particular, you would have heard about or you would have read about NVIDIA, for example. NVIDIA is a... Um, uh parts producer semiconductor that uh is expected to benefit from all of the spending that companies are going to to channel towards ai um the top 20 contributors of the index are are what's driving the us bull market and the rest of it the 480 companies in the s p 500 would still be in the red for the year if you take away the top 20 contributors. So the, the other remarkable thing is that these 14 firms that have significant exposure to AI have been pushed up in terms of price. No? So they're now trading at 43 to 77 times price to earnings ratio, meaning the earnings haven't even come in yet, but there is so much um so much exuberance and positive sentiment that people are willing to buy even if it's very very expensive um in comparison uh back in uh november 2022 the valuations for the entire market is 20 27 times and today 26 times so it hardly moved so all of the liquidity ha have been going to these uh, 14 firms with a significant exposure to tech. Now, the question is, um, will this continue? Or uh, are we setting, are, are, are we being set up for 
a bubble. Okay, so there are uh, th these two scenarios will need certain um, ingredients to come to fruition. So one thing is clear because of the very, very narrow participation uh, of, of uh, within the market or in terms of the companies that have returned positive, uh, it's a very, uh, as I said, narrow um, participation. There needs to be a broadening of the rally outside of tech stocks so that um, the, it becomes stickier. No? So the breadth needs to expand to alleviate the risk of a bubble forming. Um, on the next slide, uh, let's uh, see how that can be the case. The reason why, um, in general, uh, the rest of the market uh, hasn't really generated returns is because there are no earnings. And the, and the forward-looking earnings expectations have also been downgraded. Why? Because the Fed has been um, tightening policy because of inflation. And it's been a threat to the productivity or the GDP growth and therefore corporate earnings of the companies. So the only way that the rally can broaden is if the market believes that the Fed is actually going to be able to engineer what is called a soft landing. So the, the um, how do you say it? The... The problem is the Fed needs to control or contain inflation and bring it back to its 2% target. No? So if you can see here, US CPI hit almost, uh, upwards of 9% uh, last year. And that's why the Fed had to start raising rates uh, in their last 10 meetings. So it's a cumulative 5% adjustment. That's huge. And um, they need to... Uh, see how much the tighter policy environment is going to trickle down to the real economy. So, of course, the co corporates themselves are adjusting. They're more conservative in terms of their capex spending. And that, in turn, affects uh, earnings prospects. Now, if somehow the Fed is able to perfectly execute on its uh, tightening to bring inflation down without causing a recession, then it becomes a very, very ripe environment for the market uh, rally to broaden out to outside of the very narrow um, selection of sectors. So the last thing that is that needs to be um, uh, so the last pillar or the last holdout uh, of the U.S. economy is the labor market. There is still uh, wage inflation that's still threatening to um to uh it's threatening the the risk of inflation not coming down to where the Fed needs it to be, uh and so uh they're watching uh labor data very very carefully uh policymakers and market participants. The the um remarkable thing is uh in different markets. Uh, there, there are several narratives that are being priced in, and it's not necessarily consistent. So, in one end of the spectrum, your markets are pricing in a full blown recession. In other parts, it's pricing in no recession. No recession. So that's where it's very, very important to manage um, investment exposures and really. Uh, be clear on a view and expressing that view no, relative, uh, regardless of what instrument, whether it's uh, through funds, direct investments. But for our managed portfolios, we're, we've been very active in allocating between equities and fixed income because of the backdrop of the uh, investing environment. On the next slide um, is a... Uh, an illustration of just how um, problematic the inflation problem is, not just here in the Philippines, everywhere in the world, in the U.S., in Europe, but in, but in particular, uh, we watch uh, what's happening in the U.S. because the Fed is the biggest central bank. And they typically, um, the, 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 the 
interest rate differentials or or where the Fed is relative to RBST, relative to the European Central Bank, relative to the People's uh, Bank of China. Those all matter and those kind of drive markets. Um, so in the U.S., uh, inflation has been coming down from the 9% level. Headline inflation, that is. But uh, core inflation, so if you strip away the um, food and energy, uh, it's the blue bars on the top left-hand chart. You'll see that it hasn't, it's come down somewhat, but it's still hovering at the 4% level. So the question is, or what markets are trying to determine is, um, how much more will the Fed likely move rates higher to contain this inflation? And um, currently in the bond market space, uh, they're saying, or, or what's being priced in is that rates are going to stay at these levels, 5%, up until December. So that means there, no, there will be no rate cuts between now and December. At least that's what the market is pricing in. And on the other hand, uh, there is a, uh, an indicator of recession expectations or the probability of a recession now at 70%. So that's at the lower uh, right-hand chart. So how do you reconcile these two things? No, um, Well, the, the broad strokes is that um, we've been on it, or the Fed, the rest of the world, more or less, has been on a tightening path because of high inflation throughout 2022 and even today. And until the Fed is done with their rate hikes, the late cycle environment will continue and you will have, uh, as I said, dispersion in terms of what the different markets are pricing in. Um, on the next chart, I'll just show you um, uh, historically how the S&P 500 in particular has performed um, six months before the last Fed hike. So th that's where uh, six months before, the we're expecting one more Fed hike this year. Eh? So that puts us around this period if, if that indeed becomes the last Fed hike. And the first Fed cut, which is not expected until uh, 2024, uh, optimistically first quarter of 2024. The the average performance of the S and P five hundred, um, for the uh historical um hiking cycles, hiking and cutting cycles. So it's in uh between nineteen seventy four to more more recently twenty nineteen. No, so the average is that blue line. What's it saying? It's flat. So for the next one year, it's more or less flat. Our average is 4% from when the Fed pauses its hikes. Um, the On the upside, in 1995, the market rallied by 12.5%. And um, on, the, on the other hand, in 1974, it was uh, um, a very big, steep losses for the market. So what's it, what's it telling us? So given the run-up um, that we've already seen uh, before uh, where we are today, we're already up, what, 14.3% for the S&P 500. And the, at this point, the risk-reward is not as attractive uh, considering that the upside is more, more likely um, limited compared to previous soft landings that we saw. So um the in the best case scenario it was up 12 and a half percent that was a soft landing so even if the fed is able to engineer the soft landing the market is already pricing that in at least the equity market while the fixed income market is pricing in a recession in the first uh or next year um is a recession a bad thing bad news not necessarily a recession will um signal the Fed to start cutting rates. And in that case, 
other parts of the markets can be poised to, to benefit. So in particular, fixed income markets. So on the next slide, um, we'll see how uh, these other markets perform. Can I go to the next slide? So here, um, again, the past uh, hiking cycles, last five, uh, shows you the six-month and one-year performance of the MSCI Emerging Market Index. So this is an equity market index. And um, the 10-year U.S. Treasury, so for bonds and for commodities. So um, there are other parts or uh if the if the if the Fed is able to engineer a soft landing, you can have uh, the emerging market space benefit from that. So that actually includes our own market, no. So it can uh, uh, when the Fed hiking cycle concludes, it can mean uh, good news for some markets in the near term. But again, the dispersion of returns will be a function of the of what's happening uh, elsewhere, uh, especially now because of how very much integrated global markets are. So the 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 underlying uh, um, driver needs to be a broadly resilient global economy. Even if there is a recession happening in the U.S., we expect uh, maybe China or other other developing countries to pick up the slack. Next slide, please. So what about um, back home? No, So that's the uh, global picture. What about back home? So it's the same framework. We look at what the BSP is uh, confronted with, and that is the same uh, inflation that is above the 2 to 4% range. The good news is um, we've since been uh, seeing this uh, deflation. So you see the blue line there, headline inflation peaked at close to 9%. Core inflation has also started to come down a little bit uh, from the for, for the second quarter of this year. The balance of risks, though, remain for inflation to be tilted to the upside because um, it's it's not just what August inflation wasn't really a concern yet for for the BSP, but because it's already. Um, raging in the US and the dollar was uh, appreciating broadly across uh, the many different currencies, there was a mechanism of imported inflation through the weaker peso. No? So um, it, while in inflation of uh, uh, local inflation is getting under control, it, it's still tied to um, the, the rest of uh, the global economy. And then there are uh, environmental risks, no? So, uh, because of a unexpected El Nino for for this year and next year, that can also um, complicate the the task of bringing down inflation. Um, although inflation is really meant to address uh, demand pull or or consumer demand. Um, in the case of 2022, there was a lot of supply shocks that also brought us to these levels. But um, the thing to remember is that that the central bank, the BSP, has been sign or has been communicating that they're they're likely to hold um, uh, the policy rate at these levels, and they are watching carefully what the Fed does. And if the inflation um, picture continues to improve towards target, so we expect inflation to be within target by next year, then that's also when um, we can expect uh, rate cuts to come through. Okay, so on the next slide, um, let's see what the implications of, of this macro picture are to the local markets no so starting with the philippine bonds um because of the rate hiking that has been taking place it's setting it setting up the market for a pretty extended or expanded runway for generating capital gains down the road so 
um, the, the chart is showing the yield curve for the different tenors of government bonds. Uh, we, we came from the orange line, the orange upward sloping curve. And then by the end of 2022, the yield curve had shifted higher. So higher yields meant lower bond prices. So if you were an investor or you were holding bonds in 2021 and you just held on to it because rates were moving higher, then the price on the bonds are or the, your portfolio, price of your portfolio, the returns on your portfolio um, would have been negative. No, So even if it's a bond, um, there is still mark to market. Um, unless from an accounting standpoint, it's hold to maturity. But then again, if it's hold to maturity, you're only uh, getting the coupons and you don't have an, a chance to um, sell it at any capital gains in case the shape of the yield curve changes. So for example, um, from the gray line to the blue line, which is where we're at at present, there is a movement of yields on the long end uh, from a high level to a lower level. So that generated some capital gains on fixed income bonds. And that's why the active funds that ATRA man manages have returned about 6% just on the first half of the year. So it's the ability to um, be active even within the bond space to take advantage of the movements in the markets that allow us to, to generate these kinds of returns for our bond strategies. So um, two things to, to remember and to take away. Today, yields, absolute yields are at really, um, uh, the nominal yields are at high levels. So you get coupons that are attractive enough and the downside protection or the, the risk of losing money if rates move adjust a little bit higher is capped by the higher interest rates. And because the bias is for the, the BSP to cut rates down the road, then the yield curve can adjust lower. So we expect this um, blue line to uh, steepen again by the short end moving lower uh, than the long end. So it's going to be upward sloping again. So that movement in the yield curve is, um, again, higher rates have set set us up for an environment where capital gains can be made on uh, on bonds. Um, on the next slide, I'm going to talk a bit about Philippine equity markets. And this is just a uh, five-year graph. No? So not, not, not very long. Uh, long term is still 10 years. But uh, in the last five years, the market hasn't gone anywhere really. Uh, from the peak of 9,000 in uh, 2018, to a um, uh, trough or a drawdown just after the pandemic lockdowns took hold of below 5,000. It's a pretty big range. Um, what's more important to note is where we are at today. Uh, so the we're at around 6'4", 6'5". Again, it's a question of upside risk to downside risk. What is the target? Uh, on the base case, and our base case is that listed corporates are going to be able to deliver about 17% earnings growth for the full year. Uh, first quarter earnings uh, showing that we are well on track to that assumption and that the valuation is going to go to 15.8 times, which is not um, demanding at all. Remember, the S&P 500 is 27 times earnings. And your tech names are 44 to 72 times. The 15.8 times earnings is still lower than the 10-year average just because of uh, to take into consideration the uncertainties in this environment. But, but even with a conservative target for valuations at 15.8 times, marry, it, marry that with the 17% EPS growth we're expecting this year, that brings us to about 8.1 as the fair value, as a fair value target for the market. And from where we're at today to that fair value, that's a 26% upside. Meanwhile, uh, in case the sentiment sours further and we go down to 12.8 times earnings, where we are at today, actually, today we're at about 12 times forward earnings. 
no growth, which is already not the case because there is growth. The the bear case scenario is uh around five thousand six hundred level, no. So still, you know, still within the realm of possibilities. But just considering upside to downside, you're taking your potential payoff is twice the risk that you're taking. That's for us an attractive proposition. I'm not even gonna talk about the bull case, which is actually beyond the the high of of nine thousand. But that is just the average valuations for the last ten years, eighteen times, and the slightly better earnings growth uh, uh, assumption for the corporates, um, because uh, the the environment um, allows for for such earnings growth. Um, the other thing to note is that the reason why the market hasn't gone anywhere for the last five years is foreign flows. Foreign investors into the market have been selling out of the market. Uh, back in 2013, uh, there were at least more than 30% participation of foreign funds or foreign ownership of the Philippine uh, equity market. Year to date, we're down to 20, 23.3%. So what is the implication there? Um, should there be uh, no recession in the U.S.? Uh, soft landing, even if the uh, the best case scenario is already what's being priced in, if that actually happens, the upside is going to be driven by something else, not the fundamentals. And so it, it remains to be seen what that can be. It can be further positive sentiment, flows, whatever. But the smart money or the professional managers are going to start looking outside of the U.S. and spotting markets like our own that are in at 30% discounts to 10-year average valuation. So that should be a, a headwind, uh, sorry, a tailwind for our Philippine market um, in case the best case scenario happens of no recession or even a mild recession in the U.S. next year. Um, next slide, please. So again, this is just to um to further uh drive home the point that the Philippine stock exchange index is very, very cheap. Uh it's below, it's at 12 times forward PE. That is more than two standard deviations from the 10-year average. Meaning to say, you only see that 5% of the time. 95% of the time it would be higher than 13.3. 68% of the time, it will be higher than 15.2. And um, just, and we're not, and we're not, uh, and from our own uh, targets, we're just saying we'll go, we're going to go back to the 15 times earnings for our base case. Uh, on the right hand side, it's showing uh, where the Philippines is relative to our peers in in the region in Asia. Um, certainly flat year to date, and given the very very cheap valuations that we have relative to um, the positive earnings that we are that our corporates are able to deliver, that is that should uh, be like a a uh, very bright beacon for foreign investors who may consider allocating funds back to emerging markets, including the Philippines, if uh, the recession that happens in the U.S. is, is uh, engineered to be um, a shallow one and not a protracted one. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so these are just... Um, how, what were these? These are uh, uh, peso-dollar exchange rate assumptions. Um, I'll just leave it here, but suffice it to say that for the, the year, um, we do expect the peso to strengthen a little bit more relative to the dollar, but um, we're actually uh, around 54 today, I believe. So um, that the effects will be very much dependent on the relative movement of the BSP and the Fed from here on out. 
Next slide, please. Um, this is just a uh, detailed view of where we think our earnings growth are going to come from. Or no, sorry, the actual results of the year-on-year -year earnings growth from uh, the first quarter results. And it's really uh, banks and uh, power uh, that have um, delivered on the returns and, so, and also consumer discretionary. And this is really on the back of the whole lockdown reopening uh, that we're still seeing. Um, on the table, you'll see where our earnings forecasts are for the sectors. Uh, we think gaming from that reopening theme is still set to benefit. Um, property is a bit, uh, ha has some headwinds that it's facing. So while it's expected to deliver high, high earnings growth this year, it's going to see some headwinds, headwinds in 2024. The best place to be exposed, we think, had been banks. Um, because of the the uh, high interest rate environment that we expect to remain, there's still a lot of um, uh, margins that the banks can make on that. And also conglomerates are very attractive for foreign investors as a, as a single uh, targeted exposure for, for the Philippine market. We also listed here our top uh, stock picks based on um, our valuations for these companies. Um, next slide. All right, so um, this is my last slide, and it's really just a, uh, a, no, a summary of everything that I just said, or to connect um, our views relative to what we're doing for our discretionary managed portfolios. Uh, actually, I got a chance to spy on the first question that came in. Hindi pa ako nag-uumpisa may question na. The question wa is, how much do you put into equities or fixed income if you're a long-term investor? Um, first of all, uh, qualify natin what's long-term. Long-term to, to some people, it's different to another set of people, but basically long-term is 10 years. If you have 10 years to wait, then you can, the principle is you can um, your ability to take on risk should be higher also. Uh, but there is a difference between ability to take risk and tolerance for risk. Because if there, uh, and those two together define uh, an investor's risk profile. Ideally, they, they, there is no um, disconnect between the two. You have a high ability to take on risk and also high tolerance. So if for example, uh, you're in your 20s, you're saving for retirement, your ability to take on risk is high. Maybe you have some experience in investing already in your 20s, so your tolerance should also be um, uh, you know, high, high, relatively speaking. Then uh, you will have a strategic allocation to equities. Maybe if it's a local strategy, maybe 70% equities, 30% fixed income. And that is always the starting point. So for our globally diversified portfolios, we also have a strategic allocation to global assets. And relative to this strategic allocation, depending on the different risk profiles, we would have a view um, for our tactical tilts. So uh, I just walked you through um, the, the thinking that we have for the next few months ahead. For fixed income, we think rates are definitely um, high already, high enough and attractive enough. And considering that inflation is likely to have peaked, the policy will probably shift towards tightening in the months down the road. That sets us up for very attractive capital gains on the asset class. In Philippine equities, um, we do think that the strong dollar is still a headwind for a lot of, in, of foreign investors. But once a dollar has peaked, and that happens when the Fed is done hiking, then it sets the, the stage for more foreign uh, flows to go into the Philippine equity markets. As long as there is a, um, a, a bias towards uh, keeping rates steady where it is uh, on the global side, 
or even uh, an adjustment lower by the policymakers. Where we are not as constructive is on the global equity side because we think that there is uh, an extended risk rally on a very narrow segment of the mark of the US market and um the upside to downside risk is just not attractive uh on alternative assets and this is where commodities um and alternative strategies sit uh the concerns around growth particularly uh recession um narrative and also the failure so far of China to really emerge from the pandemic lockdowns um uh to to expectations uh, because of that disappointment um there is a negative sentiment around commodities that have rallied sig significantly in 2022 so we're we're taking an underweight uh tilt to be able to fund uh where we are most positive which is uh, philippine fixed income and global fixed income so that's it that's that's um at the coming months and uh i'm happy to take questions all right Sandra, thank you for enlightening us with the q1 q2 review and of course sharing with you sharing with us the asset allocations but be before we proceed with the q and a question uh q and a segment later i'd like to announce that atram has clinched several awards this 2023 Atram has hailed as best investment solution provider both by the International Business Magazines Award and World Business Out Outlook Awards. The company also received most innovative innovative fund management firm, most innovative fund offering company, and asset management company of the year by highly recommended from the Asset AAA Sustainability Sustainable Investing Awards 2023 for institutional investors, ETF, and asset servicing providers and just recently atram won for the best asset manager from cityware asian awards 2022 2023 and best fund management company from the annual global economics award and last but not the least our very own mr andrew Kao has been awarded by cityware asia as one of the top 25 asian selectors these recognitions serve as a testament to our unwavering commitment to creating cutting-edge investment solutions. And we believe that our unique approach to managing assets and fund has assisted our clients in achieving their financial goals. And as a result of our team's expert steadfast pursuit of excellence and innovation in assets and fund management, we are dedicated to continue to push the limits of what is feasible in the investment industry. And we appreciate your continuing confidence and support with clients and partners. And now at this juncture, we'll be moving to the questions and answer portion of this event. Feel free to send in your question. And as currently we have already have several questions coming in. I'd like to thank Sandra for answering the first question already. I guess uh, with, the, with that asset allocation uh, tilt, uh, this should serve as a guide to our uh clients and also future prospects so i can now move on to the next question which is can you identify any emerging opportunities or sectors with high growth potential in the philippine market for the third quarter of 2023 and what factors contribute to their growth prospects um the equity market <laughs> because it is at a deep discount i would say it's an anomaly where we're at today from a valuation standpoint again it's it's a bit technical no but uh, in statistics uh, there is a, a, a con the concept of standard deviation so there is an average uh, so for the last 10 years the average price to earnings valuations uh, had been 18 for the market when we were um right after we were uh um upgraded as uh investment grade by the ratings agencies right after that our our price earnings hit 22 23 and the market was still um moving higher or the the equity market was still generating positive returns because the earnings of the corporates are there so uh the two drivers of 
equity prices that have to be anchored have to be anchored on earnings and pricing valuations so and then there's a third driver but we call it animal spirits meaning to say if it's not either of the two and you you can't point to what's driving it it's animal spirits right now um in the US it's still PE expansion because uh, in 2022, it was sold down heavily, no? Kasi um, bond, uh, uh, growth names, growth stocks are long duration, uh, considered long duration instruments, no? So they're like bonds. Uh, the bond has uh, cash flows uh, in the future that need to be discounted to the present, which tells you what the price of the bond is. It's that discount factor that changes. So if the policy is moving higher, that means you have to discount future cash flows at that higher rate as well. So um in so with 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 the equity segment or the tech segment, um the the discount rate has moved from uh mataas na nga eh, kasi mat, may growth expectation na. But since the policy rates moved higher, the discount that is applied to future earnings became even greater. So the price prices of the present value of the, the tech companies sold off. Um, so uh, from a from a driver standpoint, it's still the it's still uh, er, uh, not er, it's still uh, valuation expansion that's driving it. It's not yet animal spirits. But you know we're we're not discounting anything. It's very possible that um, it just defies all uh, fundamental reasons to continue rallying, and maybe there is a more structural uh, driver, which is that in the last since the global financial crisis, um, central banks have been pumping liquidity into financial markets, and that liquidity needs to go somewhere. And because of how interconnected. The markets are uh, people, uh, investors can move in and out of markets quickly. You can have hedge funds kind of, or you can have um, those who weren't able to participate in this rally and kind of, uh, uh, there was this, ano, di ba, parang back in 20, uh, 2019 yata, yung meme stock, di ba? Um, you can have <laughs> that kind of ano, driver. So, I mean, they're all valid. But uh, as professional investors, we prefer to anchor um, our uh, strategies on the, the, the key principles. And from an earnings standpoint and a valuation standpoint, the, most, uh, the Philippine equity market is very attractive. Oh, that's nice to hear. Uh, um, just moving on to the drivers. No? Um, I believe you already mentioned the China reopening. But... Can you share us with us any trade developments in China aligned with the broader global economic trends? And are there any potential risks or opportunities do they present for investors and for businesses? Um, Ch China's a bit tricky uh, from the standpoint of directly investing into China because um, you have to be able to account for a lot of risks uh, from regulatory risk to um, just uh, transparency. Uh, so what we do know is because of the extended lockdowns in China, th there has been disappointment in terms of traction of their re reopening. They're not uh, growing at the rates that they themselves want to grow at. Uh, and so that calls for stimulus, um, policy stimulus. So you have... Uh, while we have on the developed market side, um, monetary policy tightening, we expect China to loosen. And on the aggregate, it helps uh, balance the gl glo global macroeconomic picture so that while a recession takes place on one side of the world, you have something else to um, bring profit up. And Tayo, where we stand, we are affected um, in different uh uh, scales by the two drivers, but uh, on aggregate, those will will certainly affect uh, our markets as well. Yeah, thank you, Sandra. And of course, to our audience right now, please uh, 
feel free to ask any questions, key in your questions, or any um, market outlook that you want to address uh, for your 2023 goals. Let us know uh, by typing in the Q&A button below. Okay, for the next question, Sandra, um, inflation remains a concern across major co economies, leading central banks to leading central banks to revise their inflation forecast. How do you anticipate this persistent price pressure to impact monetary policies, decision, and overall economic landscape in the coming quarters? So, so uh, no, no. Um... The, the path or the rate at which uh, inflation is brought back to target yeah. will matter. Um, so the first order of business is to get inflation down, which they have. The second order of business is to make sure that it continues to trend lower. Mm -hmm. And the third is to manage policy so that it supports the uh, movement of inflation towards target ranges without stifling economic activity. So that is the fine line that needs to be towed so that um, a recession, which is part and parcel of a, uh, an economic cycle, will not be damaging the way the, the 2008 global financial crisis was damaging to a lot of investors. Yeah, And I guess to address one of the questions from our audience, um, from... Uh, <laughs> Is it is there a major recession expected mid year of twenty twenty four, and how will that affect the global tech fund and other equity funds that we have in here in Atram? A major recession. Um, there will be a recession. It will. It can be. It can be major if the Fed continues to um, tighten policy uh, to the point where it stifles uh, the ability of corporates to um, generate earnings. And if there will be no consumers because um, the rates are high, uh, meaning to say co companies aren't going to be willing to spend, investors are just going to allow banks to mop up liquidity, um, then it can cause a uh, slowdown in economic growth, not necessarily a recession. A technical recession is just two quarters of negative growth. Yes. Um, so uh, we, you can have a recession that is not uh, debilitating to an economy. The problem becomes when it be it's a protracted recession. It, ex it, it, it uh, persists for more than two quarters there is a um economic scarring meaning to say there is a um uh, uh corporates refuse to to spend money because they don't think it will come back there there will be any profits no so at that point the central banks will need to loosen policy again and and encourage economic activity so how will it affect um global funds global tech global equity uh i showed in the slides diba uh wide range of um possible or a, a wide dispersion of returns in the past 50 years of of such a, an economic cycle and um uh i think the the better risk reward we think the better risk reward proposition is in bonds. Mm -hmm. um, the 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 equity names because of how much they've rallied already. Um, if there if a recession does come into play, then you know where the sell off is going to happen. Um, I guess alluding to the monetary policies for my next question with central banks expected to maintain restrictive monetary policies due to sticky prices and high wages. How, well, you already answered this, but how might this impact risk assets such as equities and bonds? So just to uh, emphasize on that one. Um, well, bonds, uh, we'll keep rates at a higher level, not necessarily adjusting higher, but a high at a high enough level. 
So if you're an investor, you're collecting on yield. Um, for equities, the the stock price must be a function of the profitability of the company. There is no assurance that the company will be able to generate earnings that will compensate you for the equity risk that you're taking. So the on the fixed income space, because the absolute yields are attractive enough, you are compensated for holding bonds. And when the policy environment turns and the central banks start cutting rates, you are going to benefit from the movement of yields lower on the price of the bond that you're holding. Mm -hmm. All right. And for the last question, Sandra, before I let you go, what are the key considerations for investors when evaluating the attractiveness of these asset classes in the current market environment? Um, what is your investment objective? Uh, what's your investor profile? What is your ability to actively manage your portfolio? What is the size of your portfolio? What is your investment horizon? No, so in fact, um, at Ram we cater to a range of clients. As you know, uh, we um we offer funds. We look for these funds to bring to market. We offer discretionary management services. So if you have five million um in your uh personal uh assets and you want to to grow it towards retirement for example um the, that 5 million size is enough to uh to go to more uh, a more diversified approach so we'll do the discretionary management kasi if if it's less than that parang there's also such a thing as over diversification eh. so for example you're holding uh already multi asset feeder funds Parang what's the difference between holding five multi-asset feeder funds and just one, you know? So there's there's that thing to consider. Um, there's also uh uh I mean we do offer professional investment services, but as a as an individual investor, there are principles that 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 you we must understand. Number one, you don't buy anything that you don't understand, no? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> uh, number two, um, the only free, parang the, the, there is a there is a uh, focus, a lot of focus on returns, on returns, on returns. Mm -hmm. uh, the risk component tends to be um, not considered much. Uh, remember that the volatility or the the re, the range of daily movement of the portfolio um over the long term affects the the end point so the 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 task is to keep that investment journey or the the, the value of your portfolio as steady as possible it's not going to be a straight line because nga, there is um up and down movement but if you combine it the right way uh you might uh, offset with other holdings um, positions that are not working for the portfolio. Uh, the problem is if you're not diversified and you're just holding the tech fund, for example, then you, you have to time it perfectly. no. And the hardest thing is to time the market. And, and it's really, sorry, the hardest thing is timing the market. And it's time in the market that um, spells the difference for successful investing. All right. Thank you, Sandra, for those uh, guiding uh, statements for our investors. No, I, I, and I'm really appreciate you sharing with us the difference between fine timing the market and being time in the market. And that is why in all our channels, Atram Funds is now available in many different uh, digital platforms such as Gcash. No, I would like to thank Sandra again for taking the time to join to us. And now I move on to Atram Prime that provides access to a wide range of investment options, allowing you to customize your portfolio based on your goals and risk tolerance. With a commitment to a long-term growth, such as what Sandra mentioned, Atram's Prime, Atram Prime's expert fund managers employ proven strat investment strategies 
guiding you towards building your wealth that withstands the test of time. For more information, check out the video flash on your screens. Good day. Atrum is the leading independent asset and wealth management company in the Philippines. If you are interested in investing in Atrum Prime, download the app in the Apple App Store or in Google Play Store. You can also visit prime.atrum.com.ph to know about Atrum Prime. If you have other questions, you may fill out the contact form on our website or send an email. We hope this helps. Thank you. Whether you are a beginner to the world of finance and investments or a seasoned investor who wants to stay updated, Up to date with the latest investment news and strategies, we've got you covered. Our YouTube channel, Atram Studio, has a collection of videos that features everything you need to know about finance, investments, our past webinars, and even Atram itself. Make sure you subscribe to our official YouTube channel and hit the notification bell to receive alerts on all your devices whenever up new uploads or new videos are uploaded. And you may also access our official social media pages by scanning the QR code found on your screen. Before we let you go, we kindly ask you to complete this feedback survey, which we will be flashed on your screen. Your feedback, your feedback on today's topic will be extremely useful for us in our future webinars. On behalf of everyone at Atram, We sincerely thank you for your participation in today's webinar, and we wish you your loved ones continued health and safety. Happy Friday, and we hope to see you soon in the next one. Have a great day ahead.